Open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter number 9. The prophet Isaiah, chapter number 9. Very familiar verses. I've preached them before, but I'm going to preach them today in a new way. Isaiah chapter 9. And I'd like to read verses 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And I'm going to bring some things out today that are extremely important. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. I remember very well when men landed on the moon. It was 1969. I was only 12. But I remember it very well. At that time, President Nixon made this statement. He said, the planting of human feet upon the moon is the greatest event in human history. The planting of human feet upon the moon is the greatest event in human history. I do not mean any disrespect to the president, but he was totally wrong. The greatest event in human history is not man's feet being planted on the moon, but God's feet being planted on planet Earth. When God literally stepped out of glory and became a human being. I mean, after all, what good, listen, what good does it do to put a man on the moon if we can't get God in our hearts? What good does it do to study astronomy, which is the study of the stars and the planets, if we do not know the one that the Bible calls the bright and morning star? What good does it do to study botany, which is the study of plants and flowers, if we do not know the one that the Bible calls the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon? What good does it do to study geology, which is the study of the rocks, if we do not know the one that the Bible calls the rock of ages? What good does it do to study history if we do not understand that history is really his story? And all of human history is divided by this great event, B.C. and A.D. It is the pinnacle of human history. Today I want to share with you three things concerning the question, who is Jesus Christ? And by answering that question, we understand the true meaning of Christmas. The first thing that we see is his supernatural nature. If we do not understand and appreciate his supernatural nature, then we will never appreciate Christmas the way that we should. And we will never really know the true meaning of Christmas. On the very first, you know, at Christmas, we love to give packages. We wrap up packages and we give them. We love to do that. Did you know on the first Christmas, God sent a package to earth? And you know what that package was? Listen, it was deity wrapped in humanity. You won't find a better gift than that. Deity wrapped in humanity. Now, I want to say two things about who is Jesus Christ. I want to say, number one, that when Jesus came to earth, he was fully God. It's hard for us to understand this, and it's hard for us to get our minds around it. It's, it's, it's hard, young people, for us to understand how that little baby laying in a manger, crying for milk, just like every other baby, was fully God. It's, it's hard for us to understand how that toddler, three years old, playing in the wood shavings in his father's carpenter shop, was fully God. By the way, have you ever noticed toddlers like to play with, every set, with everything except their toys? This Christmas, we will spend hundreds of dollars buying our children and grandchildren presents. And if they're toddlers, once those presents are opened, what are they going to play with? The boxes and the wrapping paper. The other day, I took my three-year-old son to a playground. It was a wonderful playground. It had slides and it had swings. And it had monkey bars. It had everything. Do you know what he played with the entire time? He played in a dirt hole that looked like a dog had dug. 
He had dirt on himself. He had dirt on everybody around him. He had dirt on everything. And his mother couldn't figure out how he got so dirty on a swing set. But here we have this wonderful, wonderful playground that he played in a dirt hole the whole time. And it's hard for us to imagine how that little toddler playing in the wood shavings of his father's carpenter shop was fully God. It's hard for us to understand how that little boy going to school, being taught to read and write, was the great, eternal, self-existing God. And yet the Bible says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, leave that up, and I want to ask you a question. Jesus is called the Word. What is a Word? I'll tell you exactly what a Word is. A word is an expression of an invisible thought. This morning, you cannot see my thoughts because my thoughts are invisible. But you can hear my words. And my words are an expression of my invisible thoughts. Do you know who Jesus Christ is? Listen, Jesus Christ is an expression, a visible expression of an invisible God. Jesus Christ is God's word to the human race. Now, what does that mean? That means everything God is, Jesus is. Everything God does, Jesus does. And everything God has, Jesus has. He is fully God. Not half man, half God, but fully God. And that's why I say without apology that if someone comes and knocks on your door, as they did our door yesterday morning, and if they deny that Jesus is fully God, that person is a liar and a false prophet. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.8, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now, who is speaking there? God the Father. Who is God the Father speaking to? God the Son. And what does he say? Thy throne, say it out loud, O God. And so he is fully God. I want to say, secondly, he is forever God. He is forever God. Look at verse 7, if you would. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be, read the next two words, no end. No end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even, next two words, forever would you look this way there was never a time when jesus christ was not and there will never be a time when jesus christ is not he is eternal he has no beginning no end he is the alpha and the omega i've said it before and i'll say it again because i like to hear it he is the only baby ever born that was older than his mother and just as old as his father let me repeat that. He's the only baby ever born that was older than his mother and just as old as his father. About 20 years ago, a song was made popular, a gospel song. You may have heard it. The title was On My Father's Side, and I love the words. It goes like this. It says, Jesus sat there in the temple, just a lad of early age, talking with the scholars who were utterly amazed. They marveled how a child could ever be this wise. When they asked how old he was, I'm sure it took them by surprise. When Jesus said, on my mother's side, I'm only 12 years old. But on my father's side, I am Alpha and Omega. On my father's side, the beginning and the end. On my father's side is the throne I left in heaven. Soon I'll sit on the right of my father's side again. Hallelujah. Second verse says, it was clear for them to see he was no ordinary boy. With every word he spoke, there was power in his voice. I can almost hear him answer all the questions be thrown when the teachers ask him, Son, where do you call home? Jesus said, On my mother's side, I'm just a lowly Nazarene. But on my father's side, my residence is heaven. On my father's side, the gates stand open wide. To my father's side, where the saints will be rejoicing when I step across the tide. To my father's side, hallelujah. Only baby ever born. Older than his mother and just as old. As his father now I realize what people say I realize what skeptics say about the virgin birth they laugh at the idea they scoff at the idea 
of a virgin birth. And they say virgins do not give birth. I want to tell you today that if you do not believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, you have some character problems. Number one, you have a problem with the character of God's Word. If Christ, listen, if Christ was not born of a virgin, then that means that God's Word is flawed. That means that God's Word is in error. Because the Bible is very clear about this doctrine. The virgin birth. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. It says, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a what? A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel. In Matthew 1, 23. The angel said, behold, a virgin shall be with child. When Mary found out that she was going to have a baby in Luke 1, 34. This was Mary's question. How shall this be, seeing I what? No, not a man. And that word no is a sexual term. How could I be pregnant since I've never been with a man? Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. There are a lot of things about the Bible that we can debate, especially in the area of prophecy. Sometimes good people debate whether the rapture comes before the tribulation or after the tribulation. And I've heard good men present a convincing case on both sides. Now, I have a strong opinion on that. But I'm not going to fall out with somebody over it if they believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We can debate the meaning of the ten toes on Nebuchadnezzar's statue all day long. We can debate whether or not the Antichrist is a Jew or a Gentile. There are a lot of things about the Bible that we can debate. But I want to tell you, the virgin birth is not one of them. It is a non-negotiable. And so if you deny the virgin birth, you have a problem with the character of God's word. Secondly, you have a problem with the character of Mary. If you deny the virgin birth, that means Mary was an impure woman. That means Mary committed fornication, which is premarital sex. Which the Bible says is a terrible sin. The Bible says flee fornication. Now, I realize that we say sin is sin and there's no degrees of sin in the eyes of God. And I know what we mean when we say that. But the fact is, God puts sexual sin in a different category. God says it's worse. Because it is a sin committed against the body. The body that God created and the body that God indwells. And if you deny the virgin birth, then you have a problem with the character of Mary. You're saying that Mary was a loose woman, that Mary was an impure woman, and that Mary committed a terrible sin. Number three, if you deny the virgin birth, you have a problem with the character of Jesus Christ. And here's why. Because if Christ were not the Son of God, that means He was just another son of Adam. A descendant of Adam, like you and like me. And the Bible says, in Adam all die. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Folks, if Christ was not born of a virgin, if he was a descendant of Adam, if he had an earthly father, then he may have been a great teacher, he may have been a great leader, he may have been a great philosopher, but he was just another sinner like you and like me if he were not born of a virgin. That's how important this doctrine is. Let me say it like this. If there was no virgin birth, there was no sinless life. If there was no sinless life, there was no sacrificial death. Because the only one that could die for the sins of man is someone that never sinned. If there was no sacrificial death, there is no salvation. And if there is no salvation, there is no hope of heaven. That's how important this doctrine is. So it is important that we understand his supernatural nature. Secondly, I want you to see his sovereign nobility. I want you to see his sovereign nobility. And I want you to see that he is a king. Notice what it says in verse 6, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the what shall be on his shoulder? The government. Jump down to verse 7. Of the increase of his what? Government and peace there shall be no end. 
upon the what? The throne of David and upon his kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, look this way. When you talk about Jesus, you're talking about a king. And not just a king, but the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, how is it going to happen that he sits upon his throne forever? How is that going to be accomplished? Look at the last part of verse 7. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, he is king of kings and you and I didn't have anything to do with it. We did not elect him and we cannot impeach him. He is the sovereign king and the sovereign Lord, listen, by virtue of who he is. If you miss that truth, if you do not understand that, then you miss the true meaning of Christmas. To really appreciate Christmas, you have to take three C's and you have to put them all together in a bundle. Number one, the cradle. Number two, the cross. And number three, the crown. Now, when it comes to Christmas, many people do not ever think beyond the cradle. All they think about is Jesus lying in a manger. That's the reason they can go to a Christmas party and actually celebrate the birth of our Savior, the birth of the King of Kings with a booze party. Can you imagine that? Celebrating the birth of our Lord by getting drunk. They do not understand that the saint, they never get beyond the cradle. They do not understand that the same Jesus that was lying in a manger later said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. They do not understand that that little baby lying in a manger would later say, do not fear man who can destroy your body, but fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. They do not understand that that same little baby lying in a manger is the one who would later say, why do you call me Lord and you don't do the things that I say? That's hard preaching for a Christmas sermon, but we need to hear it. Because it doesn't end with a cradle. There was a cross and there is a crown. And the first time he came for a cross, but the next time he's coming with a crown. Every once in a while you'll hear somebody say this, I've decided to make Jesus Lord. You ever heard that? I've decided to make Jesus Lord. If you say that, you're too late. God already did that. We do not make him Lord. We recognize his lordship. We bow the knee and we submit to his lordship. And I want to say what I said two weeks ago. I want to repeat it. If he is not your Lord, he is not your Savior. There's some silly preaching going around the country that you can accept Christ as your Savior and then later decide to make him your Lord. But whereas he is called Savior in the Bible about 40 times, he is called Lord 747 times. And all of the great salvation verses that we love to quote do not place the emphasis on his Saviorhood, but on his Lordship. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And the Apostle Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now here's my point. If he's the king of the universe, and he is, he deserves to be my king and your king. Christmas ought to be more than a time of just celebrating and opening packages and eating too much. Christmas ought to be a time when we stop and realize that God stepped out of heaven. He came to earth. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead. And He deserves to be the Lord of our lives. Christmas is a wonderful time for us to rededicate our lives to His Lordship. His sovereign nobility. Are you still with me? Say amen. Third thing I want you to see is His saving name. Look again at verse 6 if you would. Verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now let's read about his name. His name shall be called. Let's just read them together out loud. Ready? Wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting father. The prince of peace. Wow, what a name. What a name. I want to share with you what these names speak of. 
First of all, there is the name wonderful, and that speaks of his wonder, obviously. Can I ask you a question today? Do you stand in awe of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you still get excited when you think about him? Or have you lost your wonder? Have you lost your sense of awe? Sometimes our souls get callous. Sometimes we get so used to something that we lose our sense of awe. I told you last Sunday that my wife and I were recently in Manhattan, downtown New York City. And all we could do is look up. Wow. Look at the buildings. Look at the skyscrapers. Look at the lights. All we could do is look up. But do you know what the people around us were doing? Looking down. Walking, looking down at the sidewalk, doing the best they can not to make eye contact with anybody else. And it was as though they didn't even notice this amazing place. Do you know why? Because most of them have lived there for years and they've lost their sense of wonder. They've lost their awe. And that is exactly the way we get sometimes with the Lord Jesus Christ. We get so used to being saved. We get so used to the privilege of coming to church. We get so used to the privilege of prayer. We get so used to the idea of having a copy of God's Word that we lose our sense of wonder. I heard a story, a wonderful story, about a man that was on a train. And he just sat there looking out the window. And then he would say, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And then a little bit later, he'd look out the window and say, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. A little bit later, wonderful. Finally, the guy next to him said, why is everything so wonderful? He said, son, several years ago I went blind and I just had surgery that restored my sight. He said, I'm seeing things that I haven't seen for years and they're wonderful to me. And it may be that today we need to get a fresh new look at the Lord Jesus Christ. His name shall be called Wonderful. Secondly, notice his name shall be called Counselor. That speaks of his wisdom. Can I ask you a question? Do you ever need a counselor? We all do at times. I heard about a a pastor that whenever he married a couple, he insisted on doing premarital counseling, no exceptions. There was a widower and a widow in his church that wanted to get married. They were both in their 80s. Both of them were married for a long time before their spouses died. But the pastor insisted on doing premarital counseling, no exceptions. So he sat down with them and he said to the gentleman, he said, sir... Do you love her? And the old man said, I don't know. He said, is she a good cook? He said, I don't know. The pastor said, man, does she have money? He said, I don't know. Pastor said, good night, man. Why do you want to marry her? He said, she can drive at night. (laughs) Isn't it funny how your standards change from time, you know, as, as time goes by? There are times we all need a counselor and you know sometimes people come to me for counselor and my wife can tell you that this what I'm getting ready to say is so true. Many times we're just a few minutes into the counseling session when we realize we can't solve these people's problem. So you know what we try to do? We try to point them to the one who can. Just by way of personal testimony I can't tell you how many times that I have been faced with a dilemma, a situation that I really did not know what to do with. And I tried my best to fix it, and I tried to fix it, and I tried to fix it, and I tried to fix it, and I couldn't. And then finally, I did what I should have done in the first place. I got on my knees and prayed about it. And in a moment, God gave me an idea, or God showed me the way. In a moment that I could not see in hours and days and weeks of trying to fix it. Why? He's my heavenly counselor. And the Bible says that he is wisdom personified. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us, what? Wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. May I recommend my counselor to you today? I'm not against counselors, especially if they're good Christian counselors. The lady that stood up here a few minutes ago, Janet Lee, is a wonderful Christian counselor. And I'm not against counseling. And I think sometimes it's needed. And I do a lot of counseling myself. But I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there are times when no counselor can help. All we can do is turn to him 
And when we do, I'm here to tell you, he will be faithful to be our counselor and to give us the wisdom that we so need. The Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally. And it is the one prayer that God will always answer yes to. Notice what else the Bible says about his name. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. What's the next one? What's the next one? The Mighty God. The Mighty God. And this speaks of his wealth. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about material wealth, though certainly that is a part of it. And it never ceases to amaze me how God provides for his people. But that's not really what I'm talking about. When I talk about his wealth, I'm talking about true wealth. I'm talking about things like God's power when we need it the most. Let me just tell you something about how great God is. I learned something this week that I thought was interesting. I want you to picture one teardrop. I'm going to put a picture on the screen and I didn't, didn't do it. But just picture one little teardrop. Got that in your mind? It's comprised of molecules. If you took the molecules in one teardrop, and if you turned each molecule into one grain of sand, you would have enough material to build a road a half a mile wide and two feet thick from New York to San Francisco. Isn't that amazing? I want to repeat that. In case you didn't catch it, if you took the molecules in one teardrop, turned every molecule into one grain of sand, you would have enough material to build a road a half a mile wide and two feet thick from New York to San Francisco. No wonder we like to sing, what a mighty God we serve, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. His name shall be called the mighty God. Look at the next one. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God. What's the next one? The Everlasting Father. You know what that tells me? That there is worship in his name. Did you know that Jesus Christ is to be worshipped? How many of you have ever had a Jehovah's Witness knock on your door? I want to tell you... I want to give you a question you can ask them that will stop them dead in their tracks. Don't be intimidated when they knock on your door. There's one question you can ask that will stop them dead in their tracks, and here it is. Ask them, do you worship Jesus Christ? See, they don't believe Jesus is God. They believe he is a created being. Ask them, do you worship Jesus Christ? They'll say, well, I revere Jesus Christ. Then you say, no, I didn't ask you that. Well, I respect Jesus Christ. I didn't ask you that. Do you worship Jesus Christ? Now, when you ask them that, they're on the horns of a dilemma. Because if they say, no, we do not worship Jesus Christ, then you say, why not? They did in the Bible. Then you show them all the places where Jesus was worshipped when he was here on earth. You show them how Mary Magdalene actually washed his feet with her hair and her tears and worshiped him show them where the wise men knelt before him when he was just a baby the bible says quote and worshiped him if they say no we do not worship him then say then you're not biblical they worshiped him in the bible why don't you but if they say yes we worship him then you say oh then you must believe that he is the eternal god that came in the flesh and they don't believe that So that'll stop them dead in their tracks. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, not only did Jesus receive worship when he was here on earth, but God approved of the worship of Jesus Christ. Because he was more than just a man. He is the God man. The everlasting father. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought he was God the son. Well, you need to understand that God the father, God the son, and God the Holy Spirit are three in one. They are not each a third of God. Jesus Christ is fully God. God the Father is fully God. The Holy Spirit is fully God, not a part of God. And yet, they are the great three in one. You say, I can't understand that. Neither can I. But I'd hate to worship a God so small I could understand Him. Let's look at this last name. Of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. 
upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong verse. Verse 6. For unto us the child is born, for unto us the son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful. There's wonder in his name. Counselor, there's wisdom in his name. The mighty God, there's wealth and power in his name. The everlasting Father, there's worship in his name. And then it says, the Prince of Peace. And ladies and gentlemen, that tells me there's welfare in his name. Not the kind of welfare the government gives, but what the heart really longs for the most, which is peace. I read a story about a pastor that was out visiting. He came across a man that was quite wealthy. We would call him a self-made man. They visited for a while, and then the pastor got around to asking, if you died today, do you know you'd go to heaven? Here's what the man said. True story. He pointed to his house, and he said, Preacher, you see that house? It's completely paid for. You see those cars? They're totally paid for. You see that wife in that house? She loves me. And I have enough money to last me the rest of my life. He said, Preacher, don't you worry about me. I'm okay. And the preacher looked at him and said, if I ask you a question, will you give me an honest answer? And the man said, sure. He said, no, wait a minute. Do not answer too quickly. He said, because I'm serious. If I ask you a question, will you give me an honest answer? And the man thought for a moment and said, well, yes. And the preacher looked at him and he said, do you have peace in your heart? He said, I told you that house is paid for. I told you those cars are paid for. I told you. Preacher said, stop. I did not ask you that. Do you have peace in your heart? He said, the man's chin began to quiver. Big old tears welped up his eyes. He said, no, preacher. I don't have peace. The preacher said, let me tell you why. Because you can only have peace through the Prince of Peace. And then he shared with him how to be saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's the peace of God. But did you know there's also such a thing as making your peace with God? I heard about a lady that was on her deathbed. They thought that she was a Christian, but they wanted to make sure. So someone said, have you made your peace with God? She knew she was dying. They said, have you made your peace with God? She said, no. They were a little bit taken back, and they thought maybe she misunderstood. So they asked her again, have you made your peace with God? She said, no. And they said, why not? You're dying. She said, because I'm resting in the peace that Jesus made with God when he died on the cross. That's a pretty good answer. You see, there's only one thing separating. I want all the young people, we love you so much. Aren't we glad to have all these Job Corps students today? Man, we're glad to have them. And in case you're visiting today and you've never heard this before, and this is not just for them, but for all of us, there's only one thing separating us from God and from heaven. And you know what that is? S-I-N, sin. God is so holy that he cannot allow sin into his presence. Man is so sinful that he cannot get into heaven. And so here's what happened. We needed a reconciliation. Somehow we needed our sinfulness to be reconciled with God's holiness So Jesus hung on a cross and he paid for our sins. Now let me tell you what he did. When he did that, he took God by one hand, he took man by the other, and with his death on the cross, he brought us together. That's why we love to sing at Christmas time, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinner reconciled. And so today, if you've never called upon his saving name, You need to do that because that's what Christmas is all about. So what have we seen today? Well, we've seen his supernatural nature, fully God, forever God. We've seen his sovereign nobility. He is the king of the universe. He deserves to be the king of my life and your life. We've seen his saving name. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon that name shall be saved. So if you're here today, I want to encourage you to do this. I want to encourage you to make your peace with God. If you have already done that, then I want you to claim the peace of God. 
and ask him to give you that peace that passes all understanding. That, ladies and gentlemen, what you see right there. Do you see it? Say amen. That's the true meaning of Christmas. It's not about presents, though I'm not against that. It's not about pie, though I'm certainly not against that. It's not about family reunions, though I am certainly not against that. I'm always thankful when they get to see me. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is what Christmas is really all about. Can you give me a big amen? 